I want you to know that I am profoundly grateful to have been given this opportunity today to speak in chapel at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I am truly honored and appreciate so much opportunity. A few years ago in the state of Mississippi, John Grisham, a name you may find familiar, written a few best-selling novels, he was invited to give the commencement address at Mississippi State University. He called the president of the university and he said, I want to know what's the longest commencement speech that's ever been made. And he told him, he said, what's the shortest commencement speech that's ever been made? He said, well, about 12 minutes. John Grisham says, I'm going to break a record today. I'm going to be the shortest commencement speech that's ever been made at Mississippi State University. And he did so. He kept his word, eight minutes. Well, I'm not going to break any records today, but I want you to know that I was reminded before I came out a few moments ago by my good friend, esteemed Dr. Jerry Gerard, that there is no such thing as a bad, short sermon. You may agree. Take a look together today at a single verse of Scripture, a verse that I believe as much or more than any other single verse has served to shape my ministry as a pastor over the last 35, 36 years. I would certainly pray that eventually, and the race is still being run, and the jury is still out on the final outcome, but I would certainly hope that this verse of Scripture would come to define my ministry as a pastor when it's all said and done. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, and it says, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. I need to be reminded every day, and hardly a day goes by, that I'm not reminded by the words of 2 Corinthians 4, 5, who I am and who he is what his role is and what my role is. And I'm reminded how tragic it would be if we would reverse those roles. But we do sometimes, don't we? What I learned from Scripture and am reminded in this particular verse is that he is master and I am slave. What happens is occasionally we crown ourselves Lord of our own lives, don't we? And we treat the Lord as if he should be our slave, working for us, doing our bidding. We need to be sure that we're settled on this issue early on. If you can, settle on it now as you prepare and as you serve and as you go out to serve. It will save you a great deal of pain, frustration, and heartache when you remember that we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, Lord ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Evidently, there were those in Paul's day, and philosophers, that thought Paul was promoting himself, preaching himself. So to refute these accusations, Paul clearly says, we preach not ourselves. I, I hope we don't need to be reminded of that, but we may Rick Warren opened the first sentence of the first chapter of his book, A Purpose Driven Life. You've probably read it. Remember what it says? It's not all about you. It's not all about you. This ministry that we have, this calling that we have, it's not all about us. It's much bigger than us, much bigger than you, much bigger than I, much bigger than one of us or all of us put together. This is big. And we need to remember we preach not ourselves. As someone said in our worship, we may need less look at me and more woe is me. I think about the verse, Psalm 34, verse 3. It says, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt, let us lift up his name together. And when I read that verse, we preach not ourselves, I am reminded that we are to magnify the Lord. We are to lift up the Lord. 
When we in worship lift up, magnify, exalt, preach ourselves, we do a real disservice to the kingdom of God, to the name of God himself. Magnify the Lord with me. What, what could that mean? Well, obviously magnify, you put something under a magnifying glass, it makes it larger, bigger. How do you make the Lord any bigger than he already is? Isn't he as big as he can get? So how do we magnify the Lord? Well, it makes sense to me that because we preach not ourselves, we magnify the Lord, but if he's as big as he already can be, then what I must do in worship is make myself smaller in his presence. And when I become smaller, he becomes larger and bigger and magnified. And exalt his name with me. How do we make the name of Jesus any higher than it already is? How do we lift him any higher than he is? By bowing down in his presence. And being reminded, we preach not ourselves. Well then, what do we preach? We preach Christ Jesus Lord. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus Lord. In that verse, you see the three designations or the name of the Son of God. We preach not ourselves, but Christ, Messiah, Jesus, Mediator, Lord, Master. Master, Mediator, Messiah. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is in charge. He is in control. And we know that, don't we? Do we? Do we? Because every one of us on Sunday morning would sing, Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. I've noticed as a pastor that apparently there are some in the pew and apparently there are some in the pulpit who find it easy to crown him Lord with their lips while their lives are far from him. A.T. Robertson says that the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the touchstone of our faith. G. Campbell Morgan says the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the central verity of the church. E.V. Hill, who I love to hear preach and heard him many times down in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, said, In the church, we have fellowship, and we have discipleship, and we have worship, but the flagship is Lordship. We preach not ours, but Christ Jesus, Lord. And when we get right on that, we'll be right on everything else down the line, won't we? I noticed when I put my shirt on this morning that it was important that I get this first one right. Get it lined up just right. And when I got it right, all the rest of them lined up really well all the way down. But if you ever, when you put your shirt on in the morning, kind of got it off to start, and then nothing else works, does it? until you get started right. We've got to get that right. We've got to settle on that issue. Like Vance Havner said, the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the initial confession of the church. It is the authentic confession of every Christian. It is the ultimate confession of all creation. Romans 10, 9 says, Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. You see, the early church demanded a clean break with the world, the flesh, and the devil. I preached recently at First Baptist Laurel a sermon on the seven deadly sins of the modern church. I got the list from Paul Powell. One of those is salvation or forgiveness without repentance. Wouldn't you agree that that would be a deadly sin in the modern church? Offering salvation at bargain basement prices. Repentance, no repentance, though the salvation is continued to offer. Just the, the customer is always right approach to evangelism. 
You see how far we may have come from the early church demanding that clean break with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And let me just remind you of these familiar words of James chapter 4, verse 4. James 4, verse 4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship world is enmity or hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. We need to be reminded that, and we need to tell people at the very beginning, the initial confession of the Christian includes Jesus is Lord. In order for us to follow Jesus, in order for us to know him, in order for us to be a friend with God, we and our sins are going to have to part ways. Vance Hadner cites Constantine making Christianity fashionable and popular, and pagans at that point flooded lightheartedly into the church. We lowered the standard to accommodate the influx, and we've never recovered from that mistake. So too many church members are serving two gods, God and money, and we fill our churches with baptized pagans who live double lives, they come near to God with their mouth, but their hearts are far from him. They say to him, Lord, Lord, while they do not what he says. Our ministry is this. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus Lord. It's the authentic confession of every Christian. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, No man speaking by the Spirit says Jesus is accursed. And it also says that no man says that Jesus is a law is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. You know that's the authentic work of the Holy Spirit because the old man, the old Adam, never bows to the Lordship of Christ. Only when the Holy Spirit does his work does that happen. What's happened is we in our churches have created an oral distinction between making Jesus Savior and making Jesus Lord. Should be no distinction. Two sides of the same coin. The same experience turning to God and away from sin. And some people said, oh yes, but Paul said in Acts to the Philippian jailer in response to the question, what must I do to be saved? Oh, just believe. Look at it again. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus. Lord means master. We believe, I can, you, you know, you've heard it said all your life, the demons believe and tremble. <laughs> believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we preach. E.Y. Mullins said that for membership in a Baptist church, the Lordship of Jesus Christ is to be the prime condition. We preach not our Christ Jesus Lord. And of course we know that eventually, ultimately, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus Lord. And what's next? This is my role. This is your role. Ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. He is master, I am slave. He is Lord, I am servant. We don't need to get that turned around. We need to understand our role. My father-in-law, Dr. Nelson Price, many years ago when he was president of the Mississippi Baptist, or, or the, the National Pastors Conference, the Southern Baptist Pastors Conference, the theme of the pastor's conference that year was servants, not celebrities. And in keeping with tradition, he wrote a book that year by that title, in keeping with that theme of the SBC pastor's conference, Servants, Not Celebrities. He told about the space mission of Apollo 15 with astronauts Scott and Irwin, who went into outer space. They spent 60 plus hours on the surface of the moon. Many of those of those hours were outside the lunar module. They, they explored 17.4 miles of the surface of the moon, and instant notoriety was theirs, and, and certainly well-deserved celebrity. But James Irwin says, as he was returning to Earth from that 250,000-mile expedition into space, 
God's Spirit spoke to his heart, and he said, I knew. And I thought, wait a minute. I'm a servant, not a celebrity. They may be waiting for me down there to interview me, but I am a servant, not a celebrity, and I exist on this planet to serve so that others may know the glory of God. What a great reminder to all of us of our role. We are not celebrities. We are servants. Albert Schweitzer wrote and said, one thing about which I am absolutely certain, the only ones among you who will be truly happy are those who have learned to serve. To serve. You see what God's Word says, Matthew 20, 27 and 28, Jesus walking along with disciples, and the, the mother of two of them showed up, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and said to Jesus about kingdom. And it's interesting how closely they could walk with Jesus and still not have a clue about his kingdom. They thought that golden age of King David would be uh, reestablished. But the mother of these two said to Jesus, well, you're in your kingdom, you're going to need a, a first vice president and a second vice president. Let one of my boys be on your right hand and the other be on your left. Jesus said, you don't have any idea what you're asking me. It's not for me to decide that, but you don't, you don't know what you're asking. Can you bear this cup and the ten heard what was going on, and they were indignant. They were just miffed about the whole thing. What, what are, and then here's what Jesus said. The pagans, the pagans lord their power and authority over one another. Not so with you. Any one of you who wants to be great, let him serve like a slave. Any of you who wants to be chief, let him become your servant. And what did he back all that up with? For the Son of Man came not into the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He is Lord, we are servants. John 13, that picture in the upper room of Jesus girding up his loins and picking up the basin and the towel and performing the most menial, the most humble, even humiliating task that anyone could perform, washing the feet of his disciples and demonstrating for us what we are to be about. We are to be about service. Now, I tell you how I know how well I'm doing in this matter of service. I know how well I'm doing by how I feel, how it makes me feel when somebody treats me like a servant. It has been my heart's as I've said, I've wanted this verse to, to define my life and, and to shape my ministry as a pastor. So I've tried to be sure that in an humble, even at times humiliating way, I would serve the needs of my people. But when some of them treat me like a servant, and I think in my spirit, how dare they ask me to do that? How dare they expect, who do they think they are to expect me to? Then I know I'm not there yet. Because I do not preach myself, but Christ Jesus, Lord, and ourselves, your servant. We look at Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. We see the second most familiar probably of, of all the, the parables, maybe the prodigal son followed by the good Samaritan. And in that parable of the good Samaritan, you see how we are taught by Jesus in this parable, the secret of serving others. Let me just read it quickly for you from Luke 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood to test Jesus' teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus said. Master teachers very often turn those questions around and ask other questions. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Well, he gave himself away right there. You know that he never loved his neighbor because he didn't even know who his neighbor was. 
even though he'd spent his life studying the law and he knew what the law said, the law says love God and love your neighbor. And if he had ever loved his neighbor, he'd know who his neighbor was. So he gave himself away, busted right there. How do you read it? Who is the neighbor? And then Jesus gave this parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest, that's a religious man, going by down the same road, saw the man pass by on the other side. So to a Levite, another one associated with the temple, when he came to the place and saw him pass on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. He saw him, he took pity on him, went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn to take care of him. The next day, took two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, and when in return, I will reimburse you every extra expense you have. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The expert in the law said, the one who had mercy on him, go, he said, likewise. This scribe, this expert in the law, had spent his life to know what the, the Bible said, but had no idea what it meant. Warren Wiersbe shows us how in this parable demonstrates how we are to love one another in the way that this Samaritan loved the one who'd been beaten and left half dead. He said he showed compassion. And he was willing to make contact. And there was genuine care and concern. And at cost of his own, from his own pocket. First of all, he took pity on him. Compassion. He made contact with him. He went to him. How many of us, when we see on the way to church, we've got a committee meeting or got a worship service and, and someone needs us, but we, oh, wait, we got a other response. It's one thing to have compassion. But to have compassion and then to make contact, he was willing, this Samaritan was, to get blood on his suit, to get mud on his shoes. Now, the religious people in this story weren't so willing. But this Samaritan made contact. He had compassion. He cared for him. He put oil and wines and bound up his wounds. And then there was cost. He gave him his own animal, took money out of his own pocket, and took care of the needs. He's showing us how that we love one another because that's who we are. We're servants. And then I remind you quickly as we close, David Jeremiah has pointed out very clearly that in this secret of serving others that we see in Luke 10, that the secret is not in religion. Religion failed. The priest and the Levite chose not to serve fallen humanity. In fact, they put the rites, the rituals, the ceremony of the temple above fallen humanity. God help us. You know, doing religious work doesn't make one religious. Doing Christian work doesn't make one Christian. It's not religion that is the secret to serving others. And it's not responsibility. Even though it was his responsibility and he knew that, people don't do what they ought to do. People don't behave as they should behave. Only love can motivate us. Not religion, not responsibility, not requirement, response, relationship. Relationship is the secret to serving others. It's love that motivated God to save. It is love that will motivate you and I to serve for Jesus' sake. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. One of the versions translate for Jesus' sake because of what Jesus has done. That's why we are servants, because of what Jesus has done. Now, here's how I want to bring this all together 
for us today. I want to ask you to take that Baptist hymnal there in the pew in front of you, and let's turn together to hymn number 234. I just want you to read along with me one verse, the final verse, verse 4 of 234. And I want to tell you this as you're finding it. 30 years ago, I took a course at New Orleans Seminary entitled Worship Leadership, and Dr. Harry Eskew, along with two other professors in a team taught course, taught of leadership. Dr. Eskew suggested in that course that we as pastors make the hymnal a companion volume to our Bible for our daily devotion and our time alone with God. And I want you to know that for 30 years, I have done that. And the hymns continue to bless my heart and my life every day. And one of my very favorite is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We're talking about the secret of loving one another. We're talking about how the secret does not lie in requirement but in response. How it's a relationship of love that will help us be who we are meant to be. Look at that last verse. Were the whole realm of nature mine. If it were all mine, if I owned it all, if it were mine to give, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. If it was all mine to give, it wouldn't be a good enough, big enough, valuable enough present. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Listen to this. Love, so amazing. So divine demands my soul, my life, my all. So here's my prayer for you today. And here's my prayer for me today. That each and every one of us, because of what Jesus has done for us, each and every one of us for the first time or for the best time. The first time or like never before today because of what he has done for us, he will get our soul, our life, our all. Because we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together. Father, we have heard your word today. May it be so personalized in each and every one of our hearts and lives that others around us will see the difference. In Jesus' name, amen.